Hey everyone, this is Nabil Qureshi and David Wood. Um, the last of the five objections that we're going to cover, the common objections that Muslims bring up uh, in this video series, um, the unofficial Seeking Allah Finding Jesus videos. Uh, there is an official set. I would highly suggest you take a look at it. It's perfectly designed for small group study. Uh, what we're doing here is just getting together, sharing some thoughts, hoping to spur you on. Uh, if you're a Muslim who would uh, probably never get a hand on the Seeking Allah Finding Jesus official video series, I hope this video series will help you understand how a Muslim who believed in Islam truly, madly, and deeply ultimately became a Christian, though he had these objections. Um, and uh, the objection that we're going to cover now is one that I've heard many Muslims ask. Uh, I even asked it. It wasn't a strong objection of mine. It was just kind of one that I kept in the back pocket to toss out there every now and then. Um, but uh, the objection is this. If Jesus Christ paid for your sins, what stops you from continuing to sin? Once, once you've accepted Christ's payment for your sins, why not just continue sinning? Um, I've heard a lot of people ask me that question. Uh, I'll share the answer that I normally give, but David, you have thoughts to share first. Oh, I think we normally give uh, similar responses on this, but um, uh, yeah, and, you, and here again, you can see why Muslims would say this, right? We're saying Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Uh, if you're a Muslim, you're hearing this, wait, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, so you can just go sin all you want. Jesus already, Jesus paid for it, right? So you can go, uh, you know, spend all your time committing adultery and uh, go on a killing sprees, whatever you want, right? Because Jesus paid for your sins. And there are, uh, there are multiple problems with this objection, um, but uh, I'll, just, I'll just point out two. One, that's completely unbiblical. According to the Bible, if you think like that, you, you're just not a Christian. Uh, if you're not a Christian, then Jesus hasn't paid for your sins there, and so it, it doesn't apply that way. So, for instance, in, in the book of Romans, Paul says, uh, shall we continue to sin? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Right? I'm going to go ahead and sin, and then I just get, I just get more grace. And he says, by no means. And, and Paul says in Romans, uh, how shall we, who died to sin, continue to live in it? And so there's something there about, about your, you're actually, you're dying to sin. Um, but uh, also in the book of 1 John, uh, according, to, according to Jesus' apostle John, if you think like that, if you think, oh, now Jesus died for my sins, therefore I can just sin all I want. Uh, John says you're not even a Christian. Um, so let me go ahead and read a passage this is from 1 John chapter 2, um, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, so you know Jesus, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if you say that you know Jesus, but you don't do what Jesus says, you're lying, right? You might be lying to yourself, you might be lying to others, but you are wrong there. Uh, so the point here is if you were the sort of person who said, uh, Jesus died for my sins, therefore I don't need to do what Jesus wants to do, uh, wants me to do anymore. I don't have to obey his commandments anymore. Well, he says, no, you, you say you know him, but you don't really know him. You don't really know him. Uh, if you don't know him, then you're not really a Christian. So according to the Bible, that sort of thinking would rule you out as a Christian. Now, why is that important? Well, according to the Bible, that sort of thinking, I can now sin all I want because my sins are forgiven. Uh, that is condemned. That view is condemned in the Bible. But in Islam, you have some disturbingly, uh, disturbingly problematic passages that are along the same lines of what Muslims are accusing us of. So, uh, Muhammad says in, in the Hadith that if you go on the Hajj, then your sins are forgiven. Um, if you die in jihad, you die waging jihad for Allah, then you are guaranteed a place in paradise. Now, think about this. Uh, according to that passage, you're guaranteed a place in paradise if you die waging jihad for Allah. So, I could plan to die for Allah in jihad, five years from now and say, well, what am I going to do for the next five years? Well, I'm going to spend all my time uh, committing adultery and all kinds of other things and murdering people uh, just for fun, torturing old ladies, stomping uh, cats, you know, whatever I want. 
Uh, and then I'm going to go out and, and die for Allah, and then I'll go to uh, I'll go to Jannah, right? And well, that would be perfectly consistent there with what Muhammad said. And there are, of course, jihadis who do that, right? We keep we keep reading about jihadis who uh, they were at a strip club the night before and doing drugs, and then they went out and died in jihad. And then we hear on the news, you see, they weren't real Muslims. Uh, well, it's, if if they were real Muslims. That's perfectly consistent. They could say, wait, Allah says I'm going to this. So I can do whatever I want right before I get there. So they, there are Muslims who reason that way. Uh, if you don't believe that's what Islam teaches, you can work that out for yourself. There are jihadis or actual Muslims who have reasoned that way based on the claims of Muhammad. But in our book, that line of thinking is forbidden. So if you're worried about that objection, Muslims, oh, you can just sin all you want because your sins are forgiven then Allah says that your sins are forgiven if you die in jihad, and therefore you can do whatever you want. The objection applies to you, does not apply to us, but there's more. Well, in, in that verse, by the way, is Surah 9, verse 111, uh, Surah Tawbah, or... Um, surah oh, yeah, I was talking about the Hadith. Yeah, you're, ta you're yeah, talking about... Yeah. Well, it, the verse is actually called, or has been called... The barter. Yeah, the, the verse of bargaining, or the verse of bartering, where you're trading your, you know, your life in jihad for forgiveness of sins. That's the bargain you're making. Uh, and it's been called that by Islamic theologians classically. Um, and so it's, it's not just Nabil and David's interpretation of the Quran. This is you know, what Muslims classically have interpreted. It's been discussed in Islamic theology. It's been practiced by jihadis. Um, whether or not their interpretation of Islam is your interpretation is, is another question. Even whether their interpretation is valid, another question. I'm just saying, as David has, I'm just reiterating what David said, which is there's plenty of room for that within Islamic theology classically and even today. And I also want to go over another verse from 1 John. David referred to 1 John chapter 2. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, um, here's what John says. Verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning, sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, John is saying, look, Jesus came to destroy sin. So if you are sinning and you continue sinning, you're coming exactly against the very purpose for which Jesus was here. So you're of the devil. That's what, that's what John is saying. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Um, very much what David was saying. If, if you... If you want to sin, if you want to keep on sinning, then you're coming against God. You're not a Christian. You're not born of God. That's literally what John is saying. Um, and, and there's good reason for that. Um, when Jesus is giving his proclamation uh, of the gospel, the good news of the coming of God's kingdom, um, he's preceded by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was preaching a message of repentance. And Jesus Christ, when he starts preaching, always says you have to repent um, because the kingdom of God is at hand. That's, that's the way the message is being provided. Now, what does repentance mean? You know, in English, we think repentance can just mean saying you're sorry. Like something as... Or feeling bad. Or feeling bad. I heard that from my testimony video. David, you don't seem to feel much. You don't seem to feel bad enough, so you haven't repented. Not what it means. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tied to this emotion or, or this uh, very you know, singular act of saying, oh, I'm sorry, that's repentance. That is not what the Greek word metanoia means. The, the, the word repentance in the Greek uh, can be broken down into two, and basically what it means is a changing of your mind, a changing of the way you think, the way you process. You no longer want to sin. That's what repentance is. You, you, you no longer are, uh, have a proclivity towards sin. You want to live for God. You want to please God. And out of love for Him, you don't want to sin anymore. That is the necessary prerequisite for becoming a Christian. You have to repent first of your sins in this true meaning of repentance. And then you can accept what Christ has done for you on the cross. Repent first. And then follow Christ. Um, that's, that's the way he taught it. That's the way the Gospels teach it. Um, and if you say, oh, I just want to keep on sinning. Oh, Jesus Christ has already paid for my sins. You've excluded yourself. You've disqualified yourself. Um, you're, you're not doing what 
what Christ has called us to do, which is to be changed in the way of our thinking first, be renewed in the attitude of our minds by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's the point I want to close with. It's the point I made in, in my book, No God But One. Ultimately, what the Christian message is, what the gospel message is, is an affirmation to love God with all that you are. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Um, and then, of course, in that, as you love God, you love your neighbor as yourself, too. Uh, but, you know, that's another discussion for another day. To love God with all that you are. Um, that's what it means. That's what the gospel truly means. And in, in so doing, you will then follow Jesus, because uh, Jesus is God incarnate. You will follow him. You will obey him. You won't just pay lip service to him. You will actually want to follow him in what you do. And, and that means not sinning. It means doing uh, living the way he lived. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to live the way Jesus lived. It, it, it is a disturbing view of ethics that says the only reason, the only reason that you would uh, not sin, the only reason that you would not do something bad is because you want to avoid punishment. So, I mean, if, if I said to my kids, uh, guys, whatever you do today, I'm not going to punish you. Oh, well, now it's, it's okay to just murder a bunch of people, right? If, that, if the only reason my kids were doing, the, were doing the right thing and avoiding the wrong behaviors is because they feared punishment for me, that is very, very, very seriously flawed view of ethics, right? They should, be, they should want to do the right thing. They should love me and want to do what I'm saying. And similarly, I mean, if you say, if the, your only reason to obey God is because you want to avoid hell and you want to, you want to get to heaven, then it's kind of, you're obeying out of a kind of a selfishness, right? I want what's best for me at the end of the day. If, if you think about it, if you say, hey, there's a little old lady over there, I want to help her across the street, but it's because she might give me some money. Are you, what are you really doing that's right, right? If you're just out to get something out of it, uh, how, what, what kind of great thing are you doing? But if you do it just because it's the right thing to do, uh, or just because you love people, well, I would say there you're, you're, actually, you're actually doing the right thing for the right reason. So you can do the right thing for the right reason, or you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. If you're doing the right thing, helping the old lady across the street, but you're doing it for the wrong reason because you just, you just want to get something out of it, uh, I, I would question, I, I, I certainly wouldn't say that's the best. The best case scenario would be to do the right thing for the right reason. What, what Christian ethics is, is you're obeying God because you love God. You obey Jesus because you love Jesus, not to avoid punishment. Jesus paid for your sins, and now you obey him out of gratitude and love for what he has done for you. He gave you life, and he paid for your sins, and now you obey him. And, and this is what the scripture says in John chapter 14. Uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And it's just part and parcel of loving God. Um, and so... The objection actually shows a lot more insight into the person asking the question, hey, if you're forgiven your sins, you can just sin all you want. It's like, wait a minute, you're telling me a lot about yourself mm -hmm. right now. That's your view. The only reason. That's your view. The only reason you obey God is to avoid punishment, not because you love God. So uh, it's another one of those objections that points the fingers back at the, uh, at the objectioner. Um, We've got two more videos we're going to do uh, in this uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus unofficial video series. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you for the next one.